Hello everybody, my name is Alyssa Peterson. I am one of the student success coordinators down on the second floor. Um, I just want to post this really quickly. Um, hopefully this will be helpful for you. Um, this is for assessment students. Um, it's just a quick guide um, for chapters one, two, and a little bit of three. Um, things that will probably be on your first test and your final. Um, but um, this is just a quick overview. We're going to kind of talk about the nursing process, the different types of assessments that we can do, the difference between subjective data and objective data, how we collect them and why we collect it, um, talk about the phases of the interview when we're going over interview questions with our patient, um, standard of precautions is going to be on here and then a little bit of the physical exam as well. So um, how I have it kind of broken up is um, we'll have like a slide that kind of reviews things or summarizes it for you um, and then I have some practice questions that we'll go over together and kind of break down the, uh, the questions together. So um, here we go. So first we're going to talk about the nursing process. Um, ADPI, right? So we're going to assess, analyze, plan, implement, implementation, and evaluation. So this isn't something that you'll just need for this class. This is something that you'll use throughout the rest of your nursing school career. So when we're assessing, we're gathering the data, we're collecting our subjective and ob objective data about your client. And this is when we really want to focus on how the client's health is affected by their daily living. So does their, um, you know, gait or the fact that they're in a wheelchair um, prevent them from um, having complete control in, over their ADLs? So um, this is a big part of what we can do and how we can impact the patient um, as nurses, right? So we can't prescribe anything for them, we can't, um, you know, diagnose anything for them, but we can give them tips and tricks on, on how they can um, better live a more independent and complete life. Um, step two is the diagno uh, diagnosis. Um, so this is where you're going to be analyzing the data collected to make your nursing diagnosis. This is your I identifying your problem and formulating your nursing diagnosis. Um, again, these are things that we can do, what we can do to help um, that patient in their daily living. Um, then we're going to move on to step three, which is our planning. This is where we're going to write a uh, a plan of care um, for the patient to hopefully meet those goals and so um, we're determining outcomes the criteria to develop a plan so um, that would be um, our step three step four implementation this is carrying out the plan this is actually physically you know giving the pain medicine um, teaching them um, whatever our, our plan was, this is us actually carrying it out. And then step five, evaluating. Was our plan effective? Did it work? Would, do we need to be revisions? Do we need any revisions? Um, was it um, an, achievable, an achievable or a realistic goal um, for this patient or this particular client? So that's what we do with our evaluation step. So here is a question. Um, a nurse in a clinic is interviewing a client who is undergo who will undergo diagnostic testing. The nurse should ask about the client's potential allergies during which phase of the process. So is this going to be under your planning, evaluation, assessment, or implementation? So when are we asking the client about potential allergies? that is going to be under our assessment, right? That's when we're getting all that subjective and objective data. Um, we're interviewing the client, getting to know them um, and all their signs and symptoms that they're either have had in the past or coming in with today. Um, and that includes allergies. So that's gonna be under your assessment. 
Next question, a nurse has received change of shift report for a group of assigned clients. The nurse has met with each patient and completes her head-to-toe assessment. Which of the following activities should, a, should the nurse perform next regarding the patient's care using the nursing process? So we've met all of our patients, we've completed their head-to-toe assessment, so what are we doing next according to our nursing process? So critically analyzing the client's data to determine priorities, collecting and organizing data, set the client uh, set the client-centered measurable and realistic goals, um, determine the effectiveness of the interventions. So it has already said that we've collected um, her head-to-toe assessment and data. And so we can kind of eliminate um, collect and organize data because we've already done that. So are we going to critically analyze the data to determine priorities, set um, goals, or determine the effectiveness of our interventions? So after we collect, we then analyze. So then we're going to figure out well, what is our priority, who's our priority patient, who do we need to see first, what do we need to do first, and um, for Next question, a nurse is providing care for a client with elevated temperature. The client is given the prescription medication and the nurse checks the client's temperature and at repeated intervals. What step of the nursing process is being used to determine the client has achieved the outcome criteria for this treatment? So is this assessment, evaluation, diagnosis, or implementation? So. Um, what step of the nursing process is the nurse using to determine if the client has achieved the outcome? Well, that sounds like evaluation to me, right? We're evaluating, did our medicine work? Um, we're rechecking our temperatures and seeing, has their, has their temperature, has their elevated temperature come down and decreased? Um, and hopefully it has, and so then we can say goal met, um, or maybe it hasn't and we need to um, tweak our interventions, or maybe add some interventions, take some of the blankets off, um, um, give them cool ice packs to, to decrease their temperature, or things like that. Okay, so these are the different types of health assessments that we can complete. Um, this is going to be important information to know. It'll definitely show up on your test, um, giving you an example and you needing to identify which type of um, an assessment this is. So an initial assessment or initial comprehensive assessment, this is going to be your total health history, um, your total health assessment that needs to be done when a patient very first enters into the healthcare setting. So we've never seen them before, we have no history on them, and we have no background information on them, we need to collect all the subjective data that we can, um, which is clients that, uh, that's how they perceive their own health. Um, that would be all your subjective data and then also doing your physical exam and collecting objective data about that patient. So that is your initial um, health comprehensive assessment. An ongoing or partial assessment is kind of like a mini overview of what you've already established in your comprehensive assessment. So. Um, this is um, focusing on um, a particular problem. Um, you're going to reassess things that you are already previously identified that were you found in your comprehensive assessment. Um, and then the frequency or how often we do an ongoing assessment is going to depend on your acuity of your patient. So someone who um, is in heart failure you know, is going to have um, more frequent or ongoing assessments, whereas someone who um, stubbed their toe, um, we're, we can do that a little less infrequently. Um, but it's going to be a mini overview of, of what we've already established. Um, a focused assessment or a problem-oriented assessment. Um, so it does not replace a comprehensive assessment. Um, but it's done when a client comes in with a specific health concern, right? They say, my ear hurts or my throat hurts. Um, so we're just going to do a thorough assessment on that particular 
problem that particular system and exclude any of your other systems. So like the example, my ear hurts, you're gonna fizz, you know, go through your questions and kind of cold spall them with that, right? Location, pain, onset, what makes it better, what makes it worse? Can you describe that pain? Um, you're gonna really focus on their ears, their you know, ears, nose, mouth, and throat, but it would be inappropriate or unnecessary to go into questions about their um, sexual function or, you know, their normal bowel movements if they're just coming in for an earache, right? It's not information I need to know. I need to just focus on the problem at hand. Um, so again, it doesn't replace your comprehensive assessment, but it's when someone comes in for a specific concern um, and you're only focusing on that affected body system. Okay, and then lastly, our emergency assessment. This is, you're gonna think about ABCs, right? You're gonna do a rapid assessment that you need to perform in a life-threatening situation. Um, <clears throat> so it's, again, inappropriate and um, gonna waste precious time if you're gonna try to sit them down and go through, you know, well, how does that make you feel? Or um, tell me about um, your normal bowel movements when they're coming in with a gunshot wound, right? Um, just doesn't make sense, we're not gonna spend that amount of time. We have to stabilize them, get them into um, a safe setting, and then we can um, go back later and maybe complete our initial comprehensive assessment. But in an emergency situation, it's just a quick rapid assessment so that we can stabilize them as quickly as possible. Okay, so we have a system or have a question that's gonna be a select all that apply. So which action should the nurse perform before beginning the initial shift assessment of the client? So we're gonna review the client's records before meeting the client, determine knowledge and self-care based on age, education, and experiences, gather assessment tools after meeting the client, revise nursing care plans to reflect important improvements in the client's condition, um, or check the client's status with the nurse of the previous shift. So sometimes students really hate the select all that apply questions because they can be overwhelming, right? You feel like you have to pick at least two or three answer choices in order to you know, make it a correct answer. And if you miss one, then you miss the whole thing. Um, so I um, encourage you to think as true or uh, select all that apply questions as true or false, right? So each individual answer choice, A, B, C, or D, is it true or false that I would do this before um, beginning my initial assessment of this client? So um, review the client's records before meeting the client. Yes, I'm gonna look in the health record, I'm gonna look in their chart and see what's going on so I can give gather the most information possible about this client. So that's true, I'm gonna select that one. Um, B, determine knowledge of self-care based on age and education experience. So those are probably not appropriate to do. I'm not gonna make um, judgments or inferences about this patient based on his age or education or experiences. So that's not an appropriate answer. I'm not gonna choose B. Gather assessment tools after meeting the client. So I'm gonna go in there, I'm gonna meet my, client, introduce myself, and then I'm going to say, hang on, I'll be right back. Let me go get my stethoscope. Um, doesn't really work, right? We need to gather all of our supplies first before we go in and, and meet our client. So we're not going to choose C either. Revise nursing care plan to reflect improvements in the client's condition. So yeah, that's important that I need to do that. I need to update his, his plan of care um, so that I can appropriately plan my day and, and make goals that are appropriate for him um, if his um, condition is improving. And then the last one, check the client status with the nurse of the previous shift. Yes, that's how I'm gonna get my information, that's how I'm gonna get my report. I need to meet with the previous shift uh, nurse so that I can see what she did for her shift and how the patient responded to her interventions. So our correct answers are A, D, and E. All right, here's our next question. For which client should a nurse perform a focused assessment? So remember that's where we're just gonna focus on that one body system. Elevated blood pressure with no previous history of heart problems, 
right upper abdominal pain that radiates into the groin, four-day history of a sore throat and fever with enlarged lymph nodes, a diabetic with elevated blood sugars for the past two weeks. So where do I need to make that focused assessment? So elevated blood pressure with no previous history of health problems, right upper abdominal pain that radiates into the groin area, four-day history of a sore throat and fever with enlarged lymph nodes, or D, diabetic um, with elevated blood sugars for the past two weeks. So how do I determine which one is going to be a focused assessment? So elevated blood pressures with no previous history of heart problems. Um, that needs to be a comprehensive assessment, right? Because I need to look at what is actually going on with this patient. I have no previous history of heart conditions. Why is this elevation in blood pressure happening? So I need to do a full comprehensive initial assessment to determine and gather that information. Um, so that is not going to be our focused assessment. Um, right upper abdominal pain that radiates to the groin area, um, that would be in an emergency assessment, right? Um, that's more acute. We really need to know exactly what's going on um, to, in order to determine <clears throat> what's um, happening with this patient, what's causing this pain. So that would be your emergency assessment. <clears throat> so we're down to C or D four-day history of a sore throat and fever with enlarged lymph nodes or diabetic with elevated blood sugars for the past two weeks. So um, D is actually going to be an ongoing assessment, right? We've already identified a problem and um, we're following up and evaluating those sugars um, over this, the last couple weeks. So C is your correct answer for your focused assessment. He comes in with a specific problem, he's got a sore throat and fever, I can really just focus on that body system um, in order to assess what's going on with him. So subjective data, the client, um, the, this is information that you obtain from the client. Um, uh, these are the client's sensations or symptoms, how they perceive and feel their, their health. Um, it also involves their desires or their preferences, their spiritual beliefs, um, their ideas, their values. All of that is kind of under the umbrella of subjective data. So um, we can't verify this. Anything that they say that's subjective, there's, there's no way for us as the nurse to verify um, what the client is saying. So Examples like this is going to be pain, dizziness, exhaustion. I've just been so exhausted for the past four days. Well, there's no way for me to verify that or measure that. So um, I'll put that under um, the umbrella of subjective data. Itching, nausea, um, sadness, loneliness. Um, so this is all going to follow under the umbrella of subjective data. Family history is going to be under subjective data. Personal health history is going to be under subjective data. Um, their acuity level, level, their culture, their review of systems, that's all under um, subjective data. So here's some practice questions for subjective data. Um, a nurse is working with a client who has AIDS. Which of the following is an example of subjective data that might be gathered from the client? Um, so presence of bacterial pneumonia on the blood test, um, the client's latest CD4 cell count, the client's pain level, or the client's current body weight. So what are things that I cannot verify? I can verify a blood test, I can verify a CD4 cell count blood test, and I can verify their weight. I'll go stick them on a scale and see what their actual true weight is. And so the thing that I can't verify, the thing that is subjective to the patient um, is their pain level. Okay, so what is the best action by a nurse when a client has difficulty describing a chief complaint? So this is um, a really common question that's probably going to show up on a test or something similar to this and um, definitely could show up on NCLEX. Um, so 
ignore the complaint and return to it at a later time in the interview. Wait in silence until the client can find the correct words. Restate the question using simple terms or provide the client a laundry list of words to choose from. So they're having difficulty describing exactly what they're here to be seen for, right? I have pain, it's just, I don't know. Uh, they can't really describe exactly what they're feeling. So ignoring it, that's not appropriate. We're not gonna do that. Uh, that's uh, not professional. Waiting in silent until the client can find the right word. Uh, that's probably not very professional either. Um, what's most likely is going to happen is the client's just going to you know, shut down and they'll stop trying to describe it because you're just sitting there waiting for them to, to figure it out on their own. Um, restate the question using simple terms or provide the client with a laundry list of words to choose from. So um, when you read the question, um, it doesn't really state anything that they're having trouble understanding what the nurse is asking, but they're having difficulty describing what's going on. So actually, the most appropriate thing that you can do is provide a laundry list of words for them to choose from. So when they're saying, like, I have pain, you know, you as the nurse can be like, well, is it sharp? Is it stabbing? Is it radiate? Is it dull? Um, is it... Um, you know, come and go, is it constant? You can start kind of listing things out and then they can be like, oh yeah, that's that's what I feel. They have an easier time kind of like picking picking it out of a list than trying to come with it up with it uh, to be able to describe it on their own. So objective data, these are things that you as the nurse or the examiner can directly observe or verify. So. These are physical characteristics that you notice with the patient, either dry skin, um, they have a wound, um, the size and shape and you know odor and discharge of that wound, um, body functions, so respiratory rate or heart rate, their appearance, their appearance, are they clean, are they disheveled, do they have malodorous or do they seem um, clean, well kept, um, appropriate for stated age. Um, their behaviors, are they um, you know, crying, laughing, pleasant, in, you know, unpleasant, combati combative, and um, those are all behaviors that you can observe. Um, measurements like blood pressure, temperature, height, and weight, um, those are all under your umbrella of objective data. And then lab values, your platelets, or your any sort of results like x-ray results, that's all going to be under your objective data as well. So here's some practice questions with objective data. Which assessment findings should the nurse document as objective? Um, a biographical information, body functions, personal relationships, or lifestyle practices. So which one can we observe? Which one can we verify? And that's going to be your body functions. Um, everything else is under the umbrella of subjective data. A nurse is completing a client's health, a client's history and physical examination. Which of the following information should the nurse consider subjective data? Blood pressure, cyanosis, nausea, or petechiae. So which one can I not verify? Um, I can verify blood pressure very easily. Go grab a blood pressure cuff and um, measure what his blood pressure reading is. Cyanosis, I can verify that as well. I can tell and look at his um, mucous membranes or fingers to see if he has either central cyanosis or peripheral cyanosis. Nausea, um, there's no way me, for me to verify his feeling of nausea. Um, so probably that, but let's read all of our answer choices. Or petechiae, I can tell and assess his skin. I can see if he has um, that purplish small rash on his skin. So the correct answer is, na is nausea. Uh, that would be considered subjective data. Now, 
vomiting, that would be objective, right? I can verify that they've vomited, um, but I cannot verify their feeling of nausea. Um, let's see, next question. So a nurse receives report on a client admitted for new onset of lung cancer and reviews the initial comprehensive assessment. The nurse recognizes that which information is subjective and needs validating by further, da further data collection. So all of these answer choices are going to be subjective data, but the question's asking which one needs to be validated by further data response. <laughs> um, so the client reports a productive cough with rust-colored sputum. The client denies any feelings of anxiety or stress over the diagnosis. Pain is reported seven out of 10 um, and occurs with deep breathing or reports a 30-year history of cigarette smoking. So the key word here is that the client has lung cancer, um, a new onset of a lung cancer. They have a new diagnosis. So for our client to be like, no, I feel fine. I have no problem with this. This doesn't stress me out at all. Like that's gonna send some, or it should send some red flags for you. Rust colored sputum, that's should be expected with uh, lung cancer. Pain reporting seven out of seven with deep breath, or seven out of 10 with deep breathing. That's again, an expected finding with lung cancer. A 30 year history of smoking. That's probably why he's got lung cancer. So the only thing that like, should raise a red flag that doesn't quite fit is they say that they feel totally fine, no anxiety, no distress over this diagnosis. Be like, well, that's not normal. You've you've just been diagnosed cancer. That's a big life changing event. Um, you know, we need to look further into this and, and collect more data. Um, so, moving on to the phases of the interview. So. For your pre-interview, this is when you're just gonna go and review their medical record. So before you ever step foot in the patient's room, before you ever introduce yourself, before you say, hello, my name is, you're gonna look at what has been previous collect previously collected in their medical record. Their introductory, and um, this is when you're gonna introduce yourself, tell them the purpose of their interview or the purpose of you being in the room um, and what kind of questions that the client should expect um, and making sure that you assure that this is confidential, making that then they feel comfortable, maintaining privacy. And this is when you're going to develop a trust or rapport with your patient. So, hi, Mr. Smith. Um, my name is Alyssa Peterson. Um, I'm here to do a health history and, um, and get, gather some information on you. This shouldn't take long. It should take about 15 minutes. Please let me know if you have any questions. Um, you know, I just want to remind you that this is all confidential. Um, and anything that you say in this room doesn't leave this room. Um, and I'm um, going to make sure to maintain your um, privacy and let us know if you need anything during this um, this interview or this um, assessment. So just a quick little introductory, um, letting them know what to expect, how long it should take. Um, and this is, like I said, gonna develop um, some trust between you and the client. So then we move to the working phase. This is when you're going to collect their biographical data. So their name, their date of birth, their gender, Ask them why they're seeking care. You know, what brings you to the clinic today? Why are you here? Oh, you're here just for your yearly exam. Okay, perfect. Or, oh, you stubbed your toe. Okay, well, let's see what's going on with that. Um, history of present health concerns. So you, you stubbed your toe <laughs> and then kind of cold spa that question, right? Um, your personal history, um, do they have any previous surgeries, any other diagnosis or problems that, that are going on? So do you have any history of um, diabetes or depression, um, things like that? That's their personal health history. And then you move on to their family history. Does your family have any history of diabetes or depression? Um, and gather as much family history as they can remember um, or that they know of. Um, in their um, immediate family. Review of systems or current health problems. So this is when you're gonna do each body system and address 
uh, is addressed and the nurse asks further questions to gather more information about each system. So um, again, this is going to be still under your subjective data. So it goes system by system, asking them their point of view on each system um, from kind of head to toe. And then um, you can move on to the lifestyle questions. So um, what is your activity level? Are you married? Um, do you use any drugs or alcohol? Um, do you have any other stressors at this time? Um, you know, what's going on um, with, with them personally? And then um, new jobs, things like that. Um, developmental level, so um, kind of getting their age, are they young adult, um, uh, middle, middle aged or an older adult? And then the very end of your interview, you're gonna do a summary and closing. So kind of just summarize what um, sort of data you collected um, during the working phase, um, validate or um, uh, readdress any problem areas that you've discovered throughout the working phase of your interview and then um, goals um, that you've developed with the patient. And then you know, ask them if they have any questions or concern, thank you them for their time, and that's your, your closing and your summary of um, the interview. So here's some practice questions. Um, a client is admitted to the healthcare facility for a new onset of abdominal pain, expresses um, to the nurse that they were once treated for um, gastroesophageal or reflux disease in the past. In which section of the comprehensive health assessment should the nurse document this information? So previously they've been treated for um, GERD and so uh, where are we going to document that? Um, so is this part of their personal health history, a review of systems, history of present illness, or their chief complaint? So his chief complaint is actually abdominal pain. So we can eliminate D. History of present illness. Um, it's not quite that as either because this is saying, well, now he's got abdominal pain, but you know previously he's he's had you know gastroesophageal reflux. So um, that's not a hish, that's not a present illness problem. So this is actually going to fall under your personal health history. This is something that he's been diagnosed with and treated for in the past, um, and so that is how it's going to fall under your personal health history. A nurse is collecting data on a client's chief complaint, which is pain in the heel of his foot. The nurse asks the client, when did this pain start? Which component of the symptoms uh, analyzes does this question represent? So this is your cold spa, right? When did the pain start? That is going to be your onset. When did this when did this? When did you very first notice this pain? Um, what were you doing when this happened? So a nurse assessing a client. Sorry, a nurse assessing this client uh, with regard to nutritional um, habits, use of substances, education, and work stress levels. The nurse recognizes this is what type of information. So is this lifestyle and health? practice profile, personal health history, family health history, or history of present health concern. So our stem of our question is always going to give us all the information we need in order to answer the question appropriately. So history of present health concern, he never talks about a concern, so we can eliminate that. Family health history, it's not talking anything about mom, dad, uncle, grandpa, so we can eliminate um, family, and so we can boil it down to personal health history or lifestyle and practices. And so because this is 
habits such as nutrition, substance abuse, education, we know we're going to uh, document this under their lifestyle and health practices profile. Personal health history, again, that's like our, our last question. I have a, you know, history of GERD or I have a history of um, chronic UTIs, things like that. Okay, here's our last question for this section. A nurse assesses a client who reports the onset of severe headache. During which phase of the nurse interview should the nurse ask of the nursing interview should the nurse ask the client about the history of the present health concern and reasons for seeking care? So is that going to be in your closing, introductory, working, or summary? So closing and summary are the same thing. We can eliminate that. So let's go to answers between B and C. So is it going to be an inter uh, introductory phase where you come in, introduce yourself, tell them what they're doing, what you're going to be doing, how long it's going to take, or is that going to be in your working phase where you're actually collecting all the data um, and uh, what's going on with them for that day? So it's going to be in your working phase. That's the correct answer for this one. Okay, so moving on to standard precautions. Um, you'll definitely have questions like this. Um, it's a lot about safety. You want to making sure that you understand and know what is appropriate and when is it appropriate to wear which personal protective equipment. So hand hygiene is going to be number one. It cannot be stressed enough um, in nursing school questions, during your clinical shifts, and then also when you get your first job, you're going to have a whole orientation and there's going to be an infection control person that's going to talk to you about hand hygiene and how important it is. So we want to make sure that we really, um, you understand that um, now and that you'll be successful later as well. So personal protective equipment, that includes gloves, gown or goggles or masks. So you're going to wear gloves when you're expected to come into um, blood or bodily fluids. That's when it is appropriate or necessary to wear gloves. Um, a gown is going to protect your skin or your clothes from being soiled from body fluids or blood. So if you are going into a room and you're expecting that to happen, you would need to put a gown on first. And then masks and goggles, that's going to protect you as the nurse, your mucous membranes, your eyes, your nose, your mouth from any sort of splatter that might be coming your way. So keep that in mind when you're answering questions about um, standard precautions and PPE. And here's our first question. A nurse is providing teaching to a group of assistive personnel about hand hygiene. Which of the following statements by one of the APs indicate the need for further teaching? So basically, if they say this, they don't get it. They don't understand um, hand hygiene. So as long as I change my gloves between clients, that is not necessary to wash my hands. If I am anticipating coming in contact with blood, I should wear gloves and wash my hands before I provide client care. Yes, that is correct. You should do that. I will never wear artificial nails when providing client care. Yes, you cannot wear artificial nails um, in the hospital. Uh, it's all part of your orientation packets. You know that, so that's appropriate. And then um, it is acceptable to use alcohol-based hand products after most client contacts. Yes, that is appropriate as well. If your hands are not visibly soiled, then you can just use the alcohol-based um, uh, wash that are in between each patient room. So the thing that they don't get is uh, as long as I change my gloves between clients, it is not necessary to wash my hands. You still need to wash your hands. Just like we saw back on that previous slide, um, hand hygiene is number one and can't skip that. Okay. A nurse will be performing a complete physical exam of a man who has emphysema with chronic with a chronic productive cough, including an assessment of his oral cavity. Which piece of personal protective equipment should the nurse wear? So our key words are uh, chronic productive cough, um, and we're about to look inside his oral cavity. So what PPE do we need? We need a mask, protective eye goggles, and a gown. A 
gloves and a gown, gloves, mask, eye protective goggles and a gown, or mask and protective eye goggles. So let's see what we need. We need all of the above, right? Um, and so which, uh, what we're missing from question or answer choice A is gloves because we're still needing uh, potentially having to reach inside and um, assess his oral cavity, cavity thoroughly. So we need to make sure that we have gloves on if we know we're going to be coming in contact with the um, mucous membranes. Which action by the nurse demonstrates the correct application of principles using standard precautions? Wearing gloves when um, palpating the tongue, lips, and gums. Change gloves after each body area is examined. Wear a glove, gown, wear a gown, gloves, and mask, sorry, typo, um, for a physical exam or use an aseptic hand scrub to cleanse visibly soiled hands. So again, we can eliminate D because we just talked about that in our last answer choice. If our hands are visibly soiled, then we actually need to wash them with soap and water, not just uh, the alcohol um, uh, hand scrub in between each rooms. Um, wearing a gown, uh, gloves and mask for a physical exam. So if I'm just doing a regular physical exam, I'm not anticipating to come in contact with any sort of blood or bodily fluids. I don't need to get totally gowned up head to toe with all that gear. Um, so that is inappropriate. C is inappropriate. Changing gloves after each body area is examined or wearing gloves when palpating the tongue, lips, and gum. So I don't actually, um, I mean, I definitely tell my students to use gloves like they own stock in them, um, but you don't have to then, you know, if I examine his head, I don't have to change my gloves if I then go down to, you know, examine his um, chest and upper body and then change gloves again and then go examine his back and then change gloves again and then go examine his abdomen, like that's a little too much. So and when these types of questions, you can kind of act it out and be like, no, that's ridiculous or excessive. That wouldn't be appropriate. So if I know that I'm going into his mouth, if I know I'm going to be coming in contact with the um, oral mucosa, then I absolutely know I need to wear gloves. And so um, answer A is the correct answer. When I I'm going to palpate his tongue, lips, or gums. Um, I definitely need to be wearing gloves. So then we finally get to move on to our physical exam, right? So inspect um, comes first, then we're going to palpate, um, percuss, and um, solid tissue is going to have a soft tone, fluid is going to have a louder tone, air is actually going to be the loudest tone. Um, and then auscultate. We're going to use our diaphragm using higher pitch sounds for normal heart sounds, um, breath sounds, or bowel sounds, and then we'll flip it to the bell for our low pitch sounds. So any sort of abnormal heart sounds or um, breweries that we might hear, um, we're going to use our bell for that. And so the biggest thing that you want to remember as a student um, it goes in this order of inspect, palpate, percuss, and auscultate, except for when it comes to um, the abdomen, you need to make sure you inspect first and auscultate first before you palpate or percuss because the reason for that is we don't want to disturb any sounds that might not have been there um, if we palpate or percuss. So we want to make sure that we listen to abdominal sounds first and then we can palpate and percuss because we might create something that wasn't actually there um, at rest. So moving on to some questions. Um, what physical assessment technique should a nurse use to obtain a pulse on a client? So bimanual palpation, light palpation, deep palpation, or moderate. How do we obtain that pulse? So you're going to use light. Anything too um, firm is actually...
actually going to kind of obliterate that pulse. And so you need to just use a light touch um, with the um, pads of your fingers in order to palpate your pulse. A nurse is performing an assessment on a client admitted with chest pain. The nurse knows that using the bell of the stethoscope is appropriate to auscultate for which type of sounds. So we're going to use bowel sounds, normal heart sounds, breath sounds, or heart murmurs. So remember our bell is used to auscultate those um, low sounds. That's going to be with your heart murmurs, any sort of extra beats or um, um, uh, adventition sounds you're going to use your bell with. The nurse needs to position the client in a supine position for the uh, physical assessment. The nurse should ask the client to do which of the following. Lie down with their knees bent, legs spread, and feet flat on the table. Place the client's chest and abdomen on the table with the head to the side. Lie on the client's back with their legs together on the exam table. Kneel on the table with their weight of their body supported by the chest and knees. So um, I think we can eliminate um, lie down with their knees bent apart and their legs separated. That's kind of a position that we would use to put a Foley catheter in. So we can eliminate A. Um, or D, kneeling on the table with their weight of their body supported by their chest and their knees. That's knee, chest, or hands and knees. We're not going to do that, but um, we would want them to lie on their back with their legs together on the examination table. So place the chest of, and the abdomen on the table with their head to the side. Again, that would be putting them on their, um, in a prone position, and so that would be um, inappropriate for a physical exam. A nurse is examining a child who is um, suspected to have bronchitis and is preparing to auscultate the chest with the stethoscope. Which of the following actions should the nurse, uh, should, which of the following actions would demonstrate the correct technique for this procedure? So. Uh, we're going to auscultate the chest with the stethoscope. Ensure the contact of the skin that ensure that contact with the skin is maintained. Um, application of firm pressure using the bell. Use the diaphragm to listen to low pitch sounds, or use the bell to detect high pitch sounds. So um, we know that. Actually, the diaf uh, the bell picks up low and the diaphragm picks up high, so we can eliminate C and D. Um, applying firm pressure when using the bell or ensure that the contact with the skin is maintained. So we're actually going to just make sure that we use um, light pressure, making, su making sure that the stethoscope is maintained contact with the skin, but if we press too firmly, then it actually um, obstructs our sound and we can't hear it um, as clearly. So A is the appropriate answer for that. A nurse is performing percussion over the area of the client's stomach. The nurse should anticipate hearing which types of sounds, so timpani, resonance, dullness, or hyperresonance. So make sure that you look in your book and you know the difference between these and you know um, what should be felt or what should be heard where. So the answer is actually timpani. So anything that's um, filled with air, that's going to be more drum-like, that's your timpani. Partial, um, part air, part solid, that's going to be typically lungs, that's what resonance sounds like. Dullness is going to be over solid tissue such as your liver. And then hyperresonance, very low, low-pitched, um, that's going to be lungs with um, a lot of air, so emphysema is when you'll typically hear um, that hyperresonance sound. So make sure you review that and you know those the difference and where you should hear what, what's normal. 
All right, well, that's the end. Um, I hope that this was helpful for you. Um, if you have any sort of questions or comments, concerns, you feel like you just need a little bit more clarification or um, would like to talk to somebody, please come down to the second floor um, in the Student Success Center. Uh, my office is in 220B. Um, you can either email me or book an appointment with me or give me a call in my office as well. <coughs> um, and we can discuss any of um, these questions or topics further. So I hope this was helpful and I hope you all have a good night.